You can now find all of C-SPAN's nonfiction-focused podcasts in one place, the C-SPAN Bookshelf feed. Follow now, and you'll get all of C-SPAN's podcasts that are nonfiction book-related every week. I'm Shannon. And I'm Rachel. And as part of the podcast team here at C-SPAN, we wanted to make it easy for our nonfiction book lovers to access all of our offerings in one place. Hear from authors like Kadada Williams on her book, I Saw Death Coming, Joan Biscubic and her latest, Nine Black Robes, or Neil King, who shared his walking journey from D.C. to New York City in his book, American Ramble. Featured programs will include Book Notes Plus, Q&A, Afterwards, and About Books. You can follow the C-SPAN Bookshelf feed wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. Parking, says journalist Henry Grabar, is the primary determinant of the way the place where you live looks, feels, and functions. He argues that parking policies impact the cost and availability of housing, how we plan cities and suburbs, traffic congestion, and the environment. This week, Grabar joins us to talk about how parking policies evolved and how new thinking and technology might solve some of the issues parking has created. His new book is titled Paved Paradise, How Parking Explains the World. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. Believe it or not, summer is just around the corner. Luckily, Armor All, America's most trusted auto appearance brand, has what your car needs to get that perfect summer shine. Plus, now through May 31st, we'll give you $5 for every 20 you spend on Armor All products. And that means car wash pods, protectant, tire shine, you name it. Find out how to get your $5 rebate at armorall.com. Armor All, less work, more clean. Terms apply. Henry Grabar, early on in Paved Paradise, your new book, you tell readers that you've come to believe that parking is the primary determinant of the way the place where people live looks, feels, and functions. How so? I think there's two big things to consider. And the first is land use, architecture, housing, because parking gets built into almost everything we build, it takes up a lot of room, and it costs a lot of money. And so that determines the, literally the shape of the structures that you're looking at around you. Any architect or developer will tell you that then when they begin a project, the first thing they figure out is how many parking spaces they can put on the property, inside the building, et cetera. So in that sense, parking is literally the determinant of the shape of the buildings around you. And then the other component of, of it is, of course, transportation, because uh, parking has such a determinative effect on our systems of transportation, not just because every drive must end in a parking space, um, but also because parking is an enormous uh, um, it, it determines whether we decide to drive or use other means of transportation. And in many cases, uh, providing more parking actually prevents us um, from uh, providing alternate means of, of getting around. So, so both in terms of the places we live and how we move in between the places we live, uh, parking is, is really something that needs to be understood. What's the correlation then? I can explain, see how it costs more uh, to build things with parking included, but what's the correlation between parking and housing availability? Uh, parking is very expensive. And so uh, every time you build a new home and you include parking spaces, you are uh, adding on a cost to uh, the, the cost of that home. Um, this is particularly important when you begin to think about apartment buildings, because most jurisdictions in the United States require a certain number of parking spaces with every new unit of housing. And that means that if you're building, say, a 40 unit apartment building, you need to provide between, let's say, 40 and 80 or potentially even more parking spots. And that's very expensive. And that means that when that housing gets built, it's going to cost more, perhaps 10, 20, even 30 percent more as a result of that parking being included. But it also means that many projects that can't afford to build that parking or literally cannot fit it on the site just don't get built at all. And I think a lot of the um, types of housing that Americans actually like best, the early 20th century, late 19th century uh, vernacular, things like Brownstone, Brooklyn, or um, three flats in Chicago, or uh, bungalow courts in Los Angeles, uh, all those things are impossible to build 
if you are expected to provide the requisite number of parking spaces, it simply doesn't work either on a geometric or a financial level. Later in the book, your readers will meet a group of people that are dubbed Shupistas. Who are they? The Shupistas are the followers of Donald Shoup. So Donald Shoup is the professor of parking studies. He's a professor of urban planning at the University of California, Los Angeles. And he has um, he's really pioneered this field. And so the Shupistas are the, the followers of Don Shoup. And in the beginning, they were mostly grad students who had come through uh, Don's uh, you know, classes at UCLA. Uh, but now they've expanded ever since Don wrote his book, the 2005 uh, book, The High Cost of Free Parking. Uh, the group of Shupistas now numbers in the thousands, uh, and they are people who subscribe to Donald Shoup's teachings about parking. Uh, as, 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 you know, sort of obscure as that may sound, thousands of people are in a Facebook group called the Shupistas, uh, where all they do all day is, is talk about parking. Well, you have now written a whole book about parking. How did you come to do that? Well, Shoup likes to say that uh, whatever the question, the answer is parking. And that is certainly the way it seemed to me as I went about my work as a reporter. Um, I'm a journalist at Slate, and I work on stories about housing, transportation, the environment, architecture, infrastructure. And in story after story, uh, what I began to find was that there was this subject that had been uh, largely ignored that turned out to be absolutely essential to explaining um, these various projects that were happening in the city around me, whether it was an affordable housing project that was uh, canceled because the neighbors were concerned about parking or a bike lane or a bus lane that was canceled because people were concerned about parking. Um, those may be sort of obvious, but then I even, you know, when I went to Houston to cover the aftermath of uh, Hurricane Harvey, I talked to people who told me that um, flooding patterns in Houston had had changed as a result of development. And it turns out that we've paved over so much natural land that we've actually changed the way the water moves um, during big, big storm systems. And and again, this just gets into the idea that if you think about parking as um, taking up as much land as it does, uh, you begin to realize it, it does have a systemic effect on, on, on things like architecture, transportation, and, and the environment. You underscore in interviews and in the book itself that you are not anti-car. Can you explain then what your attitude or philosophy is about cars? I think that uh, many people uh, now live in a place in the United States where they have no choice but to drive. Um, and I recognize that. And so I think to say to people, uh, it's time for you to give up your car for the environment um, doesn't make sense and would render people um, it would put people in a very difficult spot. Uh, and not to mention, I think driving is fun and it's a great way to see the country and a pretty good way to get from, from A to B. Um, but uh, the problem occurs when you, uh, at a metropolitan scale, when everybody expects to drive everywhere, you run into problems involving in particular, the storage of all those cars. And you begin to realize that if everyone's gonna drive everywhere and everyone expects a parking spot um, exactly where they're going, uh, you're just going to run into a, a situation where there isn't enough parking for everybody. And um, there's a few ways out of that situation. And uh, we've we've tried a few of them over the last century, such as building more parking and destroying more buildings to, to create more parking. Um, but 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 I think there's another path. And uh, and that path does um, rely on a sense that um, drivers will perhaps be entitled to less space uh in the city than they have been for the last 60 or 70 years but i think that in return what they'll get is an experience of driving and parking that is superior uh to the one we have now and certainly an experience of the, their neighborhood and their city that's superior to the one they have now um, i think many people who do drive everywhere would like from time to time to be able to um, make a trip on foot or on a bicycle, but they simply live in a place where it's not possible to do that. And, and one of the reasons that's impossible is because of our approach to parking policy. Do you own a car? No. And how do you typically get around? I ride a bike, I take the subway. Um, when I need a car, I borrow a car from a friend or my parents. And um, that's a system that works pretty well for me. I'm aware that that's not a system that works for everybody. And, and that's why I you know, go at lengths at the beginning of the book to say that this is not a book that's going to force you out of your vehicle. Um, but, uh, you know, the median American household has 2.2 cars. So 
um, there is a lot of room for us to uh, begin to rethink the way we have approached car ownership and car use in this country without immediately saying it's time for everybody to give up their cars. And so I think where parking policy makes a difference is you begin to create neighborhoods that have more things in them that are nicer to walk around, that are safer to walk around, um, that have more people living in them, more amenities, more schools, et cetera. And as you begin to embark on this process, you create places where people actually find it enjoyable to get around without their cars. And the change occurs on the margins. It's not uh, families with two, three cars going to zero, but perhaps it's a family with three cars going to two or a family with two cars going to one. There are lots of kind of eye-popping statistics in your book about the amount of parking in the United States and utilization of them. Can you share a couple of those? Sure. So the studies estimate that there are uh, at least three parking spots in the United States for every single car, which means that the parking stock is never uh, more than a third full. And in fact, is often uh, a lot less full than that because many of those cars are in motion. So um, I think that's the most important thing to remember, because I think when people um, understand that there are, you know, approximately a million parking spaces in this country and perhaps more, um, they think, well, if there's so much parking, then why is it so hard for me to park? Um, but the reality is that in most places, and even in places where people say it's difficult to park, there really is enough parking. Um, and studies show this because there's a whole field out there of parking consultants who are hired by cities and institutions to go in and tell them uh, to respond to their, to their, you know, basically to, to city politicians saying we have a serious parking problem here. And I've read dozens of these studies and they all say basically the same thing, which is this neighborhood, this city, uh, this town really does have enough parking. It's just that it's not properly priced. It's not properly managed. It's not shared between different uses and people don't know where it is. And uh, and that speaks for the parking situation in this country as a whole, which is to say it's it's pretty mismanaged and it hasn't really been thought through. And so um, when we begin to think about how much parking there is, uh, you realize that there's a lot of opportunity to just better use the parking we have now instead of forcing everyone who wants to build an apartment building or open a restaurant to build 10 new parking spaces, tear down the building next door, um, et cetera. Well, let's get into some of the history of how the country got into this situation. Some of our older viewers will remember a time before the 60s uh, where cities had trolley cars, electrified trolley cars, hop on, hop off. Uh, widely available uh, in the East Coast where I grew up, for sure. And you write that Los Angeles once had the most ex extensive mass transit system in the country. So over time, all of those rails and systems were torn out, torn up. Why did that happen? What shifted? Well, Americans started moving to the suburbs and um, the federal government decided to subsidize, subsidize a massive program of highway construction but decided they weren't going to spend very much money at all on preserving these urban transit networks. And so uh, they began to fall apart. And cities, of course, responded to this crisis by instead of saying it's time for us to make a serious investment in transit to ensure this city continues to be a functional place, um, they decided to, to respond instead by forcing um, everyone who wanted to build or renovate anything in the city to build a bunch of parking. And the result of that was not what they intended. I think they thought that uh, building more parking would ensure uh, that there would be less traffic because everybody would have a place to put their car and uh, drivers who came downtown would be satisfied and people would continue to ride transit and, and so forth. But instead, what happened was they required parking and uh, and the parking lots gradually began to eat away at the city. And uh, Mark Childs, one of the parking uh, writers I cite in the book, says, that parking lots ate away at the city like moths devouring a lace gown, like just a little bit here, a little bit there, until at a certain point you looked around and you realized that there, there wasn't much besides parking downtown. And that is certainly the way it remains in many, especially many small American cities today. Uh, and the result of all that parking is, is in fact not to get rid of traffic. Um, it turns out one thing we've learned in this 70 year experiment with uh, this parking policy is that the more parking you build, the more people will drive rather than the other way around. And so uh, I think a, a, an alderman I spoke to in Chicago for the book put it to me best. He said, if your number one concern is traffic, 
which I think it is for many Americans in many neighborhoods. They're obsessed with how bad the traffic is, and it's one of the reasons they um, say no to new neighbors. He said, if your number one concern is traffic and your number one request is parking, you need to understand that those two things are at cross purposes because more parking creates more traffic and it creates more car ownership. And that has been shown in study after study after study. And so building more parking far from actually taking traffic off the streets uh, seems to create it. Another uh, dynamic that you write about is that when the flight to the suburbs happen, that uh, small businesses downtown and even large businesses downtown sought to bring people back into city by, by offering free parking. How did that work out for them? Um, not well. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, the suburbs offered an incredible parking experience by the standards of people who were looking for parking in American downtowns in the 1950s, because looking for parking in an American downtown in the 1950s was not easy, right? I mean, everybody was driving downtown. It was still a bustling and vibrant place full of buildings and shops and um, and houses. And, uh, and, and you'd go out to the suburbs and you'd park at one of these brand new malls and there would be 5,000 parking spaces. I mean, for the first time in human history, you could lose your car in a parking lot. I mean, that was an entirely novel experience. Would have been unthinkable 30 years prior. Um, and, uh, and and cities thought, well, we desperately need to build to those standards. We need to, to get on their level. And I think the tragedy of that is that uh, no city was ever going to be able to offer a parking experience that was as smooth as the one you would get at the mall. Uh, they tried, they tried really hard. Um, but at the end of the day, they were not playing to their strengths. And and one of the results of that is uh, that they decided that in terms of these parking minimums that they were gonna require of various buildings, uh, that the parking minimums ought to be calibrated to suburban standards. So it wasn't just that every building in the city had to include a certain number of parking spaces, but that they had to include a number of parking spaces that would have been appropriate at a suburban car centric and isolated land use that had no mass transit access, nobody, no sidewalks, nobody able to walk to it, et cetera. And so by enshrining those standards in their zoning codes, they actually ensured that this, the buildings that came after 1950, 1960 would be built in a suburban style. And that's where you begin to see the architecture of parking requirements take, take shape, right? Which is things built after 1950, 1960 tend to look very different from the things that were built before. And that's often because the builders are working around this parking requirement, which is both, as I said, a financial and a geometric constraint. What was the impact of a 1985 book by the Institution Institute of Transportation Engineers that was called the Parking Generation Manual? How did that impact all of this? So the Parking Generation Manual is the place where all these parking laws get codified, right? So in the beginning, cities are trying to figure this out and it's not obvious right like how many parking spaces need to come with an elementary school how many parking spaces need to come with a video store how many need to come with a pharmacy uh nobody knows and so various studies are performed cities adopt various codes based on what they think makes sense but they're not really sure and at some point the institution the institute for transportation engineers comes along and puts all these codes in a book and thereafter, cities can look at the book and say, "Are we up to Are we up to code on this?" And adjust their codes to correspond to this to this manual. Um, as we know now, as we've learned since, this manual imposes suburban standards on cities, and it reliably requires everyone to build way too much parking. Your book is filled with real life experiences of the impact of this. So, tell me the story of Ginger. Is it Hitsky? in Solana Beach, California? Yeah, Hitsky. Ginger Hitsky is an affordable housing developer in Southern California. And um, I uh, learned about her because she was building a small affordable housing project in this suburb of San Diego. And she had been profiled in the Los Angeles Times because her uh, project had become the most expensive on a per unit basis in the entire state of California, which means perhaps in the entire country. And uh, the reason that it had become so expensive was because she wasn't really actually building 10 units of affordable housing. What she was really building was a gigantic 52 space underground garage on this very um, complicated site overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And the reason she had to build all those parking spots was because the neighbors would not let her 
uh, build the housing unless she provided all that parking, not just for the residents, but also enough parking to replace the surface parking lot on which the building would take place uh, or take shape rather. So um, Ginger's trying to build this 10 unit project on a parking lot in this suburb and neighbors just revolt. They just said, we will not have this. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, um, Ginger was actually ready to go um, and could have built the project with the 10 units and the 52 parking spaces, but they finally sued her and they filed a lawsuit under the California Environmental Quality Act saying that um, this affordable housing project was going to have uh, serious environmental consequences as if it were a power plant or a, a freeway uh, because people who had previously parked in the parking lot would be unable to find their way into the new uh, underground garage um, that would accompany this affordable housing project. So uh, it took this project has been planned for decades and uh, the people who are waiting for those affordable housing units are still waiting um, because neighbors killed the project over a concern over parking. And what happened in Boston with the Pine Street Inn? It's the same story. City after city, when I was working on this book, you would see stories about affordable housing projects or really just any uh, type of housing at all getting proposed where neighbors would say, uh, we do not want this project because it does not contain enough parking spaces. And this goes above and beyond what's required in the law, regardless of whether developers were in compliance with city law saying how many parking spaces they need, neighbors reliably turn to parking as a way to say no uh, to new development. And I, on the one hand, I get it because um, in many places they've become accustomed to the idea that they have a right to the curbside parking supply which is public, but they say, well, we got here first. This is where we park our cars. This is how we live our lives. And if new neighbors come to our neighborhood and they encroach on our curbside parking, uh, then that's not gonna be good for anyone. Um, on the other hand, uh, this tendency to oppose new development because uh, people fear that it's gonna take their parking spaces away has become, I think, a central facet of this country's housing shortage, which has reached um, Un, uh, unmeasured levels, right? We are at a point where it is more expensive to uh, buy a home or, or rent than at any point in the last four decades. And uh, and one of the reasons for that is we have a serious shortage of, of housing and uh, new housing in particular is really, really hard to build, especially in the urban neighborhoods um, where we need it most, where the access to jobs and amenities is best and uh, where the climate impact of housing is the smallest because people don't uh, need to drive so much. And it's precisely in those neighborhoods where uh, people use the parking shortage as a cudgel to keep out new neighbors. It's as if they perceive new neighbors not as potential friends uh, and uh, potential uh, you know, people to go to dinner with and play softball with and all that. They perceive them as coming in parking sized packages and they perceive them as a threat uh, to their to their right to the curb parking. Another aspect of the story is commercial parking. I learned in your book that the National Parking Association is 68 years old. What are their <clears throat> statistics about the size of the parking sector in our economy and how many jobs it provides? Uh, it, you know, it's very hard to say. <laughs> um, I, I think the estimate is that the, the number of people who work in parking is about the size of the U.S. Postal Service. Um, but uh, but again, you know, commercial parking is a tiny slice of of the American parking picture. I think people get very frustrated about how much, uh, well, really any time they have to pay for parking, um, but it happens pretty rarely. And uh, and and so I, I think while it occupies a central place in people's imagination, um, it is actually a relatively small part of the picture because I think statistics show something like ninety nine percent of parking is free, so. Is that right, 99%? <clears throat> I haven't visited Washington, D.C. lately, I think, is, is is my reaction to that. The number I had in your book was $131 billion for the parking sector. Does that number seem about right? And Dollars per year? Uh, that they contributed to the economy. And as you said, about 600,000 people working in it, the size of the Postal Service. Uh, one of the aspects of parking for institutions it, and why they they cling to it is that it's an often a big revenue driver. One of the stats you cited was New York Presbyterian Hospital that takes in quite a lot of money every month that adds to their overall revenues. So how does uh, institutions dependence on their parking systems add to the picture of the need for building parking? 
The complicated thing about um, institutions and parking is that they uh, they need it and they rely on it to generate revenue. But uh, often they they view the territory, um, their their real estate that's used for parking as something that could be used for something else. And in my conversations with people who work in parking professionally, um, one of the things that surprised me was that uh, they very rarely um, thought that everybody should be driving all the time. Uh, with some exceptions, um, because they recognize that at an institutional level, it is simply not possible um, in terms of space or in terms of money to create enough space and a parking spaces for everybody who wants to drive to park. And so the people who manage parking for institutions like hospitals, like universities, are actually some of the most um, forward thinking people in terms of the way they think about um, alternatives to driving and how we can uh, try and encourage people to make trips in some way uh, besides driving. Uh, obviously, parking revenue is a lovely thing to have if you're running a university or a hospital, but at the same time, um, your ultimate concern is to make sure that all your employees, customers, students, teachers, et cetera, can get to their place, uh, the place they need to be. And if that depends on everyone having a parking spot right in front of the office, um, then your institution is going to have to look like a suburban shopping center, right? I mean, that is the only uh, real form of architecture that um, that can you know serve uh, that much parking uh, relative to, to, to uh, interior space. Your book provides some interesting history about commercial parking and before credit cards, when it was a cash business, it had a pretty dark history. Can you tell me some of that? Well, for many years, parking was uh, one of the largest cash, all cash businesses in the United States. And naturally, that attracted the attention of organized crime. And uh, perhaps even more important than that, uh, just a bunch of petty theft. Um, uh, one auditor I talked to described this to me as the cigar box era, by which he meant that um, parking attendants used to collect cash for cars in a cigar box. And think about it, you've got guys who are being paid, you know, $10 an hour or less collecting in a box, potentially tens of thousands of dollars in cash every night. Um, so the potential for stealing is enormous and many people took advantage of that. Um, but then also there's a there's a higher level too where the people who run the garages, there's often some suspicion that they uh, either um, underreport the number of cars that are there or overreport them. And in, in one case, you are allowed to, um, in one case, if you underreport the number of cars, of course, you don't have to report that income to the IRS. And on, on the other hand, if you overreport the number of cars, then you can take money from some other source and pretend it came from parking. And one of the reasons that that's possible with parking is that it's very hard to keep track of how much parking has been sold, right? Like you're selling space by the hour. Um, so unless someone's there actually, uh, counting the cars and keeping uh, impeccable records of how long each car has been parked, um, then it's very difficult to go to a parking lot months or years after the fact and say, all right, how much business did you have on, on this day of that year? What's the connection between paid parking and Warner Brothers Movie Studio? Well, Warner Brothers was uh, at one point owned by, purchased in fact, by uh, a parking magnate. Uh, and, and that just goes to show the amount of money that parking can throw off in places where people are willing to pay for it. Uh, I talked to one parking impresario and he said, you know, basically the thing about parking is that, especially for paid parking, people do not want to walk. Uh, and so if you happen to own a garage at a location that's in demand, let's say it's next to a sports stadium or an airport or a downtown office tower, um, you command almost total pricing power over the people coming down there, you and your neighboring garages. And of course, the expenses involved in a, a garage are really minimal. I mean, you're uh, it's just a big block of concrete and all you got to pay for is maybe a couple people working there and to keep the lights on. And as anyone who's parked in a garage knows, the lights aren't even always uh, all on. So the other alternative in a city is street parking with a parking meter. When did parking meters come into vogue? The parking meter was invented in the 1930s by an Oklahoma City newspaper man. And um, contrary to public perception, the reason the parking meter was invented was not to make money from motorists, right? If we wanted to make money from motorists, we could raise the price of automobile registration, put a tax on gas, tax on tires. Like there's 
all kinds of easier ways and more direct ways uh, to take money from drivers. Um, but what the inventor of the parking meter realized was that he looked out at his street in Oklahoma City and he said, we have a problem where the people who work in the shops and who work in the offices arrive first thing in the morning at 8 a.m. and they park in all the best spots. And then later in the day, when the clients and the customers show up and the delivery guys come to make their deliveries, there's no place to park. Uh, and in fact, what he realized was parking had an organizational problem where uh, those best parking spots would be taken at the beginning of the day and occupied all day. And then people who showed up later had nothing to look for. And what he realized with the parking meter was um, even just by charging a little bit, you could encourage those people who needed to park all day to go and park on a side street, you know, a couple hundred meters away. And uh, what you get out of that was you would preserve access um, to these uh, prime parking spaces for people who showed up later in the day um, and needed to run a quick errand. And all that is possible with just a little bit of pricing. And in fact, a little bit of pricing is the only way that that becomes possible. Uh, and so this is why the parking meter is still with us today, albeit in slightly different and, and digital form. The only way we have of managing this precious interface between the street and the buildings is by pricing it. You uh, do a deep dive in New York City where anyone who's visited can see the challenges of getting cross town with clogged streets and double parking. In that chapter, we meet Anna Rusi. Who is she? She was a uh, New York City parking agent, a, a traffic enforcement agent, I think they're called now. And she, she wrote tickets. And for years, she was considered the best of them. And uh, I talked to her for a while about her ticket writing and how she thought about her job going around doing traffic enforcement. And um, I think uh, one of the things people need to understand about traffic enforcement agents or you know meter maids, as they're sometimes called, I think we shouldn't use that term anymore, is uh, that they are subject to a great deal of violence in their in their work. And, and she was no exception. Um, people get extremely emotional and uh and yes in some cases violent uh when they're confronted with a parking ticket um i think it's perceived both as um unfair because uh what you've stolen only uh you know a dollar or two dollars worth of uh property from the city for overstaying and and also you always feel that you've been a bit unlucky because um their your odds of being caught are are, are relatively low this is uh, such a regular occurrence with, with uh, parking agents that the network A&E had a series called Parking Wars. We grabbed a clip from it. We're going to show it to our viewers. This black truck here is directly in the no standing zone. Can't believe it's parking in the no standing zone. There's still ample parking over here. A bunch of folks. Here they go again, like clockwork. Here they come. It's too late. Really? Yeah, doing no standing. I work here. Why you didn't park? You don't have a parking area for you? Charges the park over here like 15 bucks. You got your ticket for the day. What are you gonna do? It's not the first time I've got a ticket. It doesn't matter where you park, you're still gonna get a ticket. He's always nasty. Every time I come over here, that one right there it says derogatory things to me. It's crazy. How can you be more angry than the person that I gave the ticket to? Henry Grabar, we're talking about parking in your new book, Pave Paradise. In fact, you tell us that a number of cities bring in more money from their parking violations, the tickets they give out, than they do from the meters themselves. What's that tell us about the pricing system and the way the whole meter process work? Nothing good. Um, that is uh, New York City, for example, in a recent three year period, made twice as much money from violations as they did from the meter fees themselves. And to me, what that says is that the meters are, the system is not working, right? No system should be designed to make more money from people being punished for breaking the rules um, than, than from paying, paying into it in the first place. And there's a couple of reasons this is happening. One is because the meters are underpriced, right? Uh, meters are in almost every city uh, too cheap and there are too few of them. And as a result, um, there's a serious parking shortage in busy destinations and people who need to do something in a hurry, like, you know, take a kid to a doctor's appointment or something like that, often end up being forced to park illegally um, and, and then wind up paying a fine for it. And uh, this is most perhaps 
conspicuously true of delivery trucks who will because there is never any uh, real estate at the curb available, um, they they park illegally so often that they can rack up thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars in fines every year. And unfortunately, I think cities, um, this this status quo is not good, right? Uh, the fines are huge and they, uh, they're too big and they trap people in cycles of um, debt and uh, can you know lead to court dates and even jail time. Um, which is which is terrible and certainly not anything that's warranted for a parking violation. And um, and at the same time, uh, the shortage of spaces created by these underpriced and mismanaged uh, meter systems um, creates all this traffic because it creates a system where uh, people are constantly looking for parking, circling the block, looking for parking, and then often giving up and double parking and thereby even further contributing to the traffic congestion. So um, traffic congestion, it is hard to measure the costs of it um, because it's not really cut and dry, uh, but they are enormous. Uh, every study of traffic congestion determines that it's a massive, massive drain on our economy, on our time. It creates pollution, it creates accidents. Um, and and so we would be, uh, we would really be well served by rethinking the system to minimize the amount of time that people spent looking for parking. But of course, cities do to some extent benefit here um, because they make so much money off the fines. And I think that's one of the reasons they're reluctant to change the status quo and come up with a better system. And, and the Parking Wars show is certainly a testament to that. Well, one of the other situations in New York is the exemptions. And you say the police department is the biggest violator. How how's that work? Well, in many cities, uh, public servants are often entitled to parking placards, and you will see these uh, on the dashboard in cars in Baltimore, San Francisco, Chicago, New York. I mean, uh, and we've come up with this very strange system where uh, public sector employees are entitled to free curb parking for for some reason. Um can't really say how it started, but uh, it seems to have been institutionalized as a practice for many uh, departments and certainly in New York City and in, in other cities as well. And along with um, uh, disability parking fraud, which is also a big issue, um, it further contributes to the sort of chaotic nature of street parking. Uh, in New York City, the NYPD, the New York City Police Department, is one of the biggest and most conspicuous um, violators of the parking rules um, because the, the police officers will park their personal cars on the sidewalk. And, you know, the question is, why are police officers entitled to park their cars on the sidewalk, but not, you know, the guy who works at the bodega, you know, does he not also work weird hours? Should he not also be entitled to a parking spot? I think it um, it raises some complicated questions, but it also poses a creates a, a sort of fundamental tension because the police, of course, are the people uh, literally charged with enforcing the parking rules. <laughs> and so when you see that they have such a uh, disregard for the rules uh, as they apply to, to their personal cars, it raises some questions about um, whether they're the right people to be doing that job. Well, while we're speaking about parking meters, Chicago under Mayor Daley thought it had a brilliant idea for its parking meters and went to privatize them. How did that all work out for Chicago? Very badly. In 2008, uh, Chicago on the eve of the uh, financial crisis and the Great Recession decided to lease 36,000 city parking meters to a group of investors led by Morgan Stanley for a period of 75 years. The 75 years seems like a long time to be uh, giving up your parking meters, but what Morgan Stanley uh, and its uh, um, colleagues were offering to Chicago was um, considered to just be uh, too good to turn down. It was a payment of a billion dollars. And uh, Chicago leaders thought, well, a billion dollars, um, this is obviously a great deal. Um, they hadn't raised parking meter rates in a generation. Nobody really knew how much money the system could take in if the rates were raised. Um, but they soon found out because uh, the minute they sold those meters to Morgan Stanley, the rates went up. And Morgan Stanley indeed started uh, making tens uh, and then later more than $100 million a year uh, just from the meters. And they are uh, they have already made back the money that they um, paid uh, Chicago, and it has been all of 15 years. So there are uh, 60 years left on on that deal, uh, 60 years during which Chicago will not 
uh, own its streets because that's what happened when you give up the parking meters. Um, they, they quickly realized that uh, to do anything at the curb, to build a bus lane, to hold a ticker tape parade, to build a, to open a farmer's market, any change to the street had to be approved by the group of investors that now owned um, the parking meters, Chicago Parking Meters LLC. And they would say, no, you can't build a bus lane here because you're taking away these meters that are part of our meter deal. And uh, and in that sense, Chicago didn't just give up the right to control their meter rates. They also gave up a good deal of control over their streets and not just you know now today, but for the next 60 years. Have any subsequent mayors tried to get out of the deal? Rahm Emanuel renegotiated the deal um, about 10 years ago, um, but he didn't really try and get out of it very hard. I think the hard thing about getting out of it is that Chicago pretty quickly spent down the billion dollars that um, it had uh, received in exchange. And so um, it wasn't clear how you would go about uh, getting out of the deal. They have renegotiated to some extent with uh, Chicago Parking Meters LLC, and and they no longer get charged uh, quite as much every year for um, for for various uh, violations of the terms, but we were talking a moment ago about um, placard violations and people who park illegally. And one of the conflicts that emerged after the the parking meter deal passed was that in downtown Chicago, in the Loop, uh, something like eighty or ninety percent of parking was done by people with uh, disabled parking placards, and the city quickly realized that um, they were on the hook to pay. Uh, Morgan Stanley for all that parking that was being done by um, supposed, uh, you know, people with with disabilities. And what they quickly realized was that the system of, of disabled parking placards was widely abused and that many people who did not, in fact, have disabilities were using disabled parking placards to get out of paying for parking and to give themselves a right to free parking in busy locations. And they had to go all the way to the state house in Springfield uh, to get the law changed in order to um, to, to revise that process and, and save the city tens of millions of dollars every year. Was there any political impact? How did Chicagoans feel about this Morgan Stanley deal? Oh, they hate it. Uh, it's absolutely notorious. Um, they mostly hate it because they don't like paying for parking. Um, but uh, I think those who have followed the issue closely also understand that um, free free parking has its problems, and there's something to be said for uh, charging a market price on, on busy city streets because you ensure that there's enough turnover and enough vacancy. The people who come to spend money at the shops and restaurants and, and do business can can always find a place to park, and there is something to be said for that. But um, but most people just hate it because they hate paying for parking. Um, uh, and and then and then the second level of it is, I guess they you know. Even if you hate paying for parking, the, the 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 silver lining is always the feeling of of paying money towards civic infrastructure, and that is something that we have seen in um, city after city that has successfully installed parking meters in busy downtown strips. If you redistribute the money locally, people are much more willing uh, to pay those parking meter fees because they can see that it's not going into some black hole in city hall; it's going right into improvements in the neighborhood, like street trees and park benches and all that stuff. And uh, and in Chicago, that's not the case because every penny, every quarter you drop into that uh, parking meter is is going right to a bunch of investors overseas. We're talking with Henry Grabar. His book is called Paved Paradise, How Parking Explains the World. We have a little less than 20 minutes left in our hour with him. Well, you've established for us that parking raises the cost of housing. It has environmental impacts. Uh, that it uh, causes uh, congestion in cities. So let's move on to some of the solutions that you offer in the book that people are thinking about. I want to go back to Donald Shoup. We have a clip from him uh, from uh, an interview he did with Reason TV in 2010. Let's, uh, let's see and hear him and one of the ideas that he has for solutions. I recommend three basic reforms. First is get the right price for curb parking. The second is to make this politically feasible by spending all of the meter revenue uh, to add public services on the metered block so that people see they're getting something for their money. And the third is to reduce off-street parking requirements. The city said, all right, if we put in the meters, we'll return all the revenue for added public services in Pasadena. And like that, the merchant said, that's different. You didn't tell me that. Let's run the meters to midnight. Let's run them on Sunday. Let's charge a high price. Meter money is now over a, a million dollars a year. 
uh, for a 15 block uh, business district, about the same as Westwood Village. Uh, and they replaced all the sidewalks, they uh, cleaned up all the alleys, they put all the wires underground, uh, they steam cleaned the sidewalks twice a month, they sweep the sidewalks every night, they remove graffiti every night, and it's all paid for by meter money. Old Pasadena pulled itself up by its parking meters. He's talking about old Pasadena, California, and their revisiting of their parking policies. So let me ask, with all the research you've done all this, you know, we are in this situation. The buildings have been built. There is congestion in town, et cetera. How do we rethink this in a way that will have a positive impact on the way people live? I think there's a few things that need to happen. And the, the, the low-hanging fruit is repealing parking minimums because one thing we've learned is that the more parking you create the more people own cars and the more they will drive those cars and uh ultimately the solution to getting ourselves into a better place with respect to our um our cities is is to create less traffic and and that and so the first step of that is um letting developers decide how much parking they want to build and if the answer is no uh that they don't want to build parking then what you get out of that is uh, housing at a lower price point, which I think would be a welcome thing in, in many cities. So um, that's the first step. And there is an activist group called the Parking Reform Network that is going about precisely that, going from city to city and saying, let's get rid of these codes, let people build as much parking as they want, as they think the market needs, and uh, and, and we'll see what happens. And uh, the results have been pretty good. Um, cities that have tried this have been able to, suddenly they've been able to renovate historic buildings, they've been able to build low-income housing, um, lots of housing has gotten built uh, at a lower price point and with less parking than uh, would have been built before, um, and that's a really that's a really good reform. Of course, that reform only goes so far if you don't also uh, reform the way the streets look, right? And and that means um, charging for parking in places where uh, there's not enough of it. It means um, creating safer alternatives for people to get around without their cars, um, investing in in mass transit and 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 building lanes for for buses and, and bikes and and so on. And, and all those things have to come in concert because um, building housing without parking is 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 a good first step. But uh, of course, you don't want uh, everyone who moves in there to, to buy a car and park it on the street. Tell me the story of Carol Schatz, who you call the most influential person in the renaissance of downtown Los Angeles. That was actually a quote that I heard from one of her colleagues. So she she's she's well known down there for uh, coming up with a policy that in 1999 relieved developers of the obligation to provide parking when they renovated historic structures. Now, that may seem pretty opaque and um, sort of obscure. But what happened in L.A. was they had a bunch of early 20th century, absolutely beautiful downtown office buildings that had been completely abandoned. I mean, terracotta facades, all, you know, these all this beautiful decoration and, and these buildings were, were completely abandoned. And one of the reasons they were abandoned, as it, as it uh, became obvious later, uh, was that they had not enough parking to be turned into apartments under the L.A. city code. And what Carol Schatz did was she convinced city leaders to give downtown an exemption from uh, from the code, and in particular, these historic structures and exemption. And what happened was developers came in the next decade, they took all of these historic office buildings that had been abandoned, and they converted them into apartments. And they built something like 7,000 new apartments. And that was more than downtown LA had built in the previous three decades combined. And that just goes to show so many historic structures in our cities are being held in this parking padlock where they cannot be turned into new uses because they don't have enough parking under the city code. And that was the case in LA. And what happened was all these uh, new buildings got built. And it, there's actually a lesson of this that is very particular to our current moment, because you may be wondering, well, where did people park if they didn't park inside these historic structures? Uh, it is LA, many people own cars after all. And the answer is they parked in downtown commercial garages um, that tended to empty out after 5 p.m. And so there was this really beneficial symbiotic relationship between the residents and the office workers and the garages. And suddenly all this garage space that had been uh, empty all night um, was being used by by the, the neighborhood's new residents. And I think that as we go forward and, and, and downtowns become places where people aren't coming to work uh, five days a week, what we've essentially created for ourselves is an enormous parking surplus. And so now more than ever, 
there is so much opportunity to build housing without parking and to build it in a way that is cost efficient, produces affordable apartments. And what happens to people if they decide to own cars? Well, good news, there is suddenly a surplus of parking downtown. Well, what about the suburbs? I think a lot of people will say it, it's terribly congested in the suburbs as well. Does any of this apply to them as a solution? The suburbs are in some cases where parking reform is most urgently needed. And there's a few reasons for that. Uh, one is because the suburbs desperately need more diversity in the housing stock. There are virtually no options in many towns for um, aging people who want to age in place and aren't uh, ready to keep holding on to the uh, four bedroom home they bought when they had their uh, kids living there. There are virtually no options for anyone who's in a non-nuclear family. There are no options for workers in local shops and restaurants because there are no apartments. And so uh, diversity in the housing stock is greatly needed and it cannot be accomplished unless there is relief from parking rules. And suburbs, cities have begun to reform those parking rules. Suburbs have some of the strictest parking rules. And in some cases, they seem deliberately designed to prevent new housing construction. And I think that's that's a place where reform-minded people in the suburbs really need to address that issue. Now, I know what suburban people will say, well, this is a suburb we need to drive uh and there are certainly trips of course that need to be made in the automobile but one statistic that i found when i was working on this book that i thought was interesting is that um in uh u.s metro areas including cities and suburbs half of all trips are under three miles half of them so uh under three miles is a distance that could be comfortably made on foot on a bike on an e-bike in a golf cart there are lots of ways that those trips could be made um without driving but of course, uh, in order to create an environment where people want to do that, you need to get rid of some of the parking and create nicer streets, nicer land use, nicer architecture, plant more trees. And most importantly, you need to create safe ways for those people to get around on suburban streets. And so the land use and the transportation reform have to go hand in hand. But once they do, I actually think there's tremendous opportunity for people in suburbs to start to make more trips on foot, on bike, uh, et cetera, um, because the distances aren't as large um, for a lot of those trips um, as people think they are. So as we wind down here, a few questions about technology. First of all, parking apps like Park Hero, for example, how have they changed the equation? Uh, I'm pretty optimistic about the potential of technology to change the parking experience. I think one of the things that's most frustrating about the parking about parking is that you don't know where it's going to be. You don't know how much it's going to cost. Uh, and you don't know if it's even going to be available at all. And if you think about it, that is a crazy way to run a transportation system for our entire society. Um, and uh, and and some of these apps like like Spot Hero make it possible to um, to know that there's going to be someplace available when you arrive to park your car. And I think that's a positive development. And I think uh, perhaps even more than that, the technology that would allow us to more seamlessly pay for parking is also coming. And uh, and that's going to be a huge thing as well, because I think one of the things that really rankles about parking is is literally just getting there, going to the machine. It's sort of a pain in the butt. Right. And so uh, the more seamless that becomes, I think the more willing people will be to say, all right, I'm paying for this parking. But in exchange, what I'm getting is uh, a place to park that's um, that's available when I want it right where I want it. And that's that's a huge benefit. You know, San Francisco used this technology to reorganize their street parking prices. What they did was they raised prices on the busiest blocks, but they lowered them on the least busy blocks. And it turns out the drivers responded to that. And especially they responded when the city lowered garage prices. And, and they, what they had previously done is charge the same uh, price for, for, for their busy commercial streets and for their garages, which is backwards because streets are where everybody wants to park and garages are no one's first choice. And as they raised the price on the street and lowered it in the garages, they found that arriving drivers started going to the garage first. And as a result, traffic went down. People stopped driving around in circles looking for parking spaces. And people who really wanted to park on the street right in front of the restaurant found that there was always a spot available. Two other questions about technology. What's been the impact and projected impact of ride sharing services like Uber and Lyft? I think initially it was thought that they might usher in a, an era of lower car ownership, and I don't think that's really come to pass. Um, but what I think they have done is they've opened people's eyes to the idea that a car, um, people who live in places with um, 
you know, decent transit, fairly walkable neighborhoods, um, actually can't get by without a car. Uh, and that and that um, provides them with a, a level of security about the idea that, you know, if they should need to go to the hospital one night at three in the morning, uh, there's going to be some driver available who's, who's going to be able to take them there. And I think that that is a relief to people. And it's given cover for developers who say, well, you know, one of the big reforms that has taken off is to stop uh, requiring parking at bars. You might think we require parking at bars. Yes. Lots of parking is required with every bar. And in some cases, you need to build more parking if you serve hard liquor. Um, I saw that rule down in Panama City, Florida. Uh, and uh, you may think, well, why would we want more parking the more drinking people are doing? Um, I couldn't agree more. I think it's a, it's a long overdue reform. And the existence of Uber and Lyft uh, does give cover for, for people to begin to make that change. And what about the transition to electric vehicles and the need for charging? That is going to be very, very messy um, because one in three American households does not have a private garage. And um, with an electric vehicle, the parking space is not only a place to store your car, but it's a, it's also the place you'll, you'll refuel it. And um, surveys show that as people make decisions about whether to buy electric vehicles, the thing that they get hung up on is, uh, do I have a place to charge this at home? And if they don't, um, then they often won't make that purchase. And so for people who don't have home uh, home parking, private garage where they can install a charger, we need to figure out, we need to figure out soon um, how we're going to provide them with a reliable option uh, to charge their cars and make sure that these big city neighborhoods in Philadelphia, in Chicago, in Los Angeles, don't get left out of the EV transition just because they're places where most people park on the street. So we have about three minutes left. Did the coronavirus change anything about this discussion? Uh, I think the, the primary epiphany that I had during the coronavirus was finally, um, people are beginning to see street parking space for what it might be. Um, that this curb space does not need to be necessarily turned over for free vehicle storage, that there are higher and better uses that not only generate more tax revenue, but perhaps even create a nicer street life. And I was in Cincinnati last week and Cincinnati has converted some of its restaurant patios into permanent pedestrian space. And I think that is something that would have been unimaginable five years ago. Um, the concern of course, is um, that uh, the short-term impact of these empty office districts leads to um, a, a funding crisis at transit agencies. And the result of that is a death spiral in which service cuts uh, lead people who depend on transit to, to make the decision to buy a car and, and abandon the, those systems entirely and revenue continues to go down and service goes down, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it would be wise for politicians to step in now and say, transit needs to rethink its purpose. Its purpose should not be to ensure the real estate values and survival of downtown office districts. Its purpose is to enable people to get around without cars. And that means recalibrating service to serve people where and when they need it. Not so much downtown office workers, as has been the case for the previous few decades, um, but but people, you know, parents picking their kids up from school, people working off hours jobs, people going shopping, all those uses have been poorly served by transit historically. And if you look at the transit systems that are doing the best, it's the ones that are less dependent on the downtown commuter crowd and more focused on getting people around their neighborhoods. We have just a minute left, Henry Gabar. Are you optimistic about the future with these complex problems and what city, uh, both city and suburban living will be like in the next 20, 30 years? I am optimistic, and I think one reason for that is there seems to be widespread agreement on the fact that uh, we could build things better, and and we should build things better, and we should build places where people are able to walk around and where it feels good to walk around. And I think at, at the simplest level, this book is a plea for choice. It's about choice in mobility. It's about creating environments where not everybody is forced to drive everywhere, because driving is freedom. But having no other choice, um, it, it doesn't feel so good at all. And, and I hope that one of the lessons of this book is that um, for drivers as well as for people who don't drive, um, there is a lot of promise in a world of better parking. You can read our guest regularly from his perch at Slate Magazine, where he covers this kind of, of issues. And his book is Paved Paradise, How Parking Explains the World. Henry Gabar, thank you so much for spending time with C-SPAN. Thanks for having me.
Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome. 